Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's Dealer on Webinar, How to Ignite Your Website Traffic and Set Your Sales on Fire. My name is Eliana Raggio and I'll be your moderator today. Today's webinar is being presented by Dealer on. For anyone who isn't familiar with Dealer on, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency best known for our amazing SEO, the absolute best customer service and the highest converting website designs in the industry, including the award-winning Chameleon Responsive Website Platform. We're so committed to lead conversion optimization and customer service that dealer on is still the only company in the industry that offers a money-back lead guarantee program does your website company guarantee you a 50 percent lift in leads or your money back hmm, maybe you should check us out at our gorgeous brand new dealer on website at dealeron.com we have an awesome show in store for you today we're very pleased to have scott peckstein as our presenter today scott peckstein is the vice president of sales at auto Vitel, a publicly traded automotive media and marketing company that provides both dealers and oems with highly effective brand and product promotion opportunities he's responsible for managing all sales for auto Vitel's top quality new and used car leads as well as the company's full range of industry-leading marketing and mobile products scott also serves as the lead trainer for the popular Auto by Tell Dealer Insight Series, leveraging his automotive e-commerce expertise to provide dealerships with best practices for increasing their sales as well as other valuable information so dealers better understand internet consumers and the ever-evolving digital marketplace. Additionally, he's presented informative data and sales insights at prominent industry conferences such as driving sales and NADA and in various trade media outlets such as Automotive Digest, Auto Remarketing, and Auto Success magazines. Scott is a skilled presenter, a highly respected member of the automotive community, and he can be reached at Scott P at autobytel.com. By the way, Scott Peckstein is also going to be presenting at the upcoming Women in Automotive Conference. This unique event is June 26th through the 28th in Orlando, Florida, where he'll be discussing how to understand and capitalize on women's buying behavior. And guess what? I'm going to be there too. I'll be emceeing the event. We'd love to see you. So if you want to make your way to Orlando next week, well, shoot, it's going to be a great time. To find out more about the Women in Automotive Conference and to get your tickets, please visit womeninautomotive.com or check out hashtag womeninauto16. We hope to see you there. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, use that question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. Before we get to your question live, we're going to try to respond by email later today. Also, don't forget, a link to download a copy of this webinar recording will also be emailed to you later today for your reference. Please feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. And guess what? Our good friends at Auto by Tell, they're giving away an awesome prize today on the webinar. Three lucky webinar attendees will each win $500 of website traffic compliments of Auto by Tell. Every dealership could use that. You have to be on the live broadcast to win it, though. So stay tuned. You could be one of the people winning this amazing prize today. Also, at the conclusion of this webinar, you're going to get a short survey. So fill it out, because we're always looking for great feedback from our audience, and we want your opinion to be heard. And hey, do you tweet much? We hope you do. We'd love to see what you have to say about today's presentation, so please tag us in it. You can use hashtag DealerOnWebby. I'm at Eliana Raggio. You can also hit up Scott Peckstein at Auto by Tell. We look forward to seeing what you're saying. So let's get started. Let's learn how to ignite your website traffic and set your sails on fire. Scott Peckstein, how are you, sir? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. You sound fantastic. <laughs> I've had a very busy birthday week, so thank you so much for being here today. For those of you not in the know, I just want you guys to understand, Scott and I have known each other a handful of years. This is his very first appearance on a Dealer On webinar. I, I finally, I think I put him in like a figure four leg lock, or maybe it was a half Nelson, or something like that. But whatever wrestling move it was, I finally twisted his arm enough that he said, okay, Okay, I know I have lots of great stuff to share. So today we sit here with Scott Peckstein. Scott, it's been a long time coming, my friend. Thank you so much for being here today. And you picked out a great topic. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate your having me. And specifically, it was a couple months ago at NADA where you caught me in the, uh, in the hallway <laughs> where you put your uh, leg lock on me. I think you form tackled me. But uh, yeah. no, I appreciate it. I really do. I, when, I, when I know what we need for the show, I don't hesitate. You can ask any of my other presenters. But speaking of today's presenter, <laughs> I know you have a lot of great information to get to today. Audience, you're in for a treat. We're so pleased to have Scott here. So Scott, why don't you tell the audience all the kinds of awesome things you're going to be talking about about today. 
Yeah, you got it. Thank you. Uh, so how to ignite your website traffic and set your sales on fire is the title. Uh, the reason we chose this is the world's changing. Um, the world continues to change, but more so over the past couple years, as far as the buying behaviors that we're seeing, Eliana. Um, and if the world changes and we don't change with it, we get left behind. Well, many of our competitors do change. So, you know, specifically, I wanted to talk about a few things. I've got a few objectives for this morning, this afternoon on the East Coast. Um, objective number one, identify the changes um, before we talk about how we're going to adapt with it, we've got to understand exactly what's changing and what continues to change. Objective number two, we need to recognize the causes of these changes. Um, a lot of it's around brand affection. We'll spend some time on that this morning. Um, objective number three, halfway through the presentation, we'll really talk about understanding the technologies and the processes that drive website traffic. What it comes down to and what you'll, you'll hear me talking about a lot is simply driving more traffic to your dealership website and converting that traffic. Those are the key elements in keeping up with these changes. Um, we'll, we'll wrap up with uh, challenging, challenging your traditional sales processes. You know, we've had a lot of great trainers in the industry. A lot of these trainers are still training today, but they've really changed their curriculum. They've evolved their curriculum uh, to, again, adapt with the changes. Uh, we'll end with a giveaway, and then there'll be a little Q&A. How's that sound? I think it sounds great. Let's do it. <laughs> cool. All right, a little bit about Auto by Tell real quick. Uh, we were founded over 20 years ago by a car dealer. We're really, really proud of that. Um, we're proud of our DNA that we've got today. You know, um, when we are hiring, a big, big plus, something that we look for is that dealership experience. So we're really proud of that in our sales team and our account management team and in a lot of our upper management. So... Uh, founded by a car dealer and uh, extremely proud of that. Um, number one in automotive lead generator. So this year we're going to do a little over 11 million leads. Uh, so we're really proud of that too. We've got relationships with every single OEM out there. So a lot of those leads, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that you see come from your OEM uh, do originate from uh, one of our websites. So we've got uh, a lot of um, uh, retail relationships as well. Over 60 million leads delivered since inception. So we've been around a while and we've uh, impacted a lot of sales, hopefully in your dealership as well. And what a lot of people don't know is we've evolved over the years to also have a full suite of services to improve first party lead performance. There's no better lead than a lead that comes from your website and we're proud to help generate leads from dealer websites as well, not only our own. So let's jump right into it, the buying funnel. Over the years, Eliana, I've been to I don't know now, 13, 14 NADAs in a row, uh, the digital dealers, all the different shows, and there's always somebody that's saying the buying funnel is dead. Have you ever heard that before? Oh, yeah. The buying funnel's dead, and I, I always get challenged on that because if there were no buying funnels, people wouldn't be buying cars, or they'd come into the market in the morning, they'd be buying in the afternoon. Um, it doesn't quite look like that old-fashioned funnel, right, where a consumer comes in, there's four or five different consideration sets over 30, 60, 90 days, they narrow it down to one or two selection sets, they go into the dealership and they buy. There's still a buying funnel out there. It, it, it's not a funnel, though. Um, consumers really are all over the board, and we'll get into the reasons why, but I wanted to really first point out that it's more of a 360-degree experience now. And when I say 360-degree, you see consumers online research, to social networking, to fact-finding before pulling the trigger, but we also see, and Google sees, the opposite, where consumers start with fact-checking, go to social media, go to online research, and then ultimately pull the trigger. So consumers are really all over the board. They're hard to keep up with, and again, the purpose of today's presentation, uh, the webinar, is to really identify their shopping behavior so we can capitalize on them. So I wanted to talk about uh, why. Why are consumers, why is the journey changed? Why are consumers all over the board? There's really four major contributors. Um, there's marketing influences, there's industry influences, there's knowledge influence, and there's something that we call fantasy versus reality. Um, so let's breeze through these four real quick. Let's start with marketing influences. Think back, think back 15, 20 years ago when you're advertising. Um, heck, 20 years ago, there was the internet was around, but I think it was Netscape. Right? It wasn't uh, too prominent. Um, so the majority of our dealers advertise through traditional means. So here's an example on the left-hand side of the screen of a uh, Ford dealer. And think what the consumer had to do. Right? The consumer basically sees that Ford F-150, they see the price, they see the address, and they see a phone number. What did they have to do to take further action? They had to pick up the phone, they had to email the dealership, they had to interact. They basically had to convert from that ad. 
And that's why years ago, consumers visited four, five, six dealerships before ultimately pulling the trigger. Well, look at the right side of the screen, where we are today. Consumers have all of this information at the, the, the tips of their fingertips, and they don't need to interact with the dealerships to get all this information. They can quietly shop from the comfort of their own home and not interact with dealers to get the information that they're looking for. Industry influences. The industry has continued to change. Uh, think about brand parity. Uh, in 1986, Hyundai came to North America. They had the, I think they had one model back then. They had the Hyundai Excel. Does anybody remember what it used to run for? I think the asking price was 4995 so just a little under $5,000. A couple years later, look where we've come. You've got Hyundai uh, with the Equus, with the Genesis that competes with BMW, Lexus, Mercedes-Benz. Um, you've got historical entry-level brands like Suzuki and Isuzu that no longer exist. You know, as far as uh, the increase in uh, parity that we're seeing on brand has really led to less loyal generations. You've got product parity with uh, really stemming from industry quality awards, you know, taking into consideration uh, the 2016 car of the year. It's the Kia Optima. Um, Kia was right there with Hyundai years ago where they weren't competing with major brands and they definitely didn't have the car of the year. And that coupled with improved online content, um, you know, ratings and reviews, it is not hard for a consumer to hop on a website and whether it's social media or what have you, and get other people's opinions and ratings and reviews on those vehicles. So it's really making the whole car buying experience a little bit cloudy and, um, and pretty, pretty competitive, right? Think back, back in the Midwest especially, right? You had your Ford families, your Chevy families that had bought Fords for 30 years in a row and there was nothing in the driveway other than a Ford F-150 and a lot of things happened over the years. Um, a decade ago, there was a tsunami that really leveled the playing field when imports weren't available. Um, a lot of these consumers that were driving Lexus and BMW are now looking at domestic brands and vice versa. A little bit about knowledge influences, how they play a role. Uh, you've got 31 models in the midsize sedan segment alone today. So think about that for a second. For a consumer looking for a midsize sedan today, they've got 31 different choices. All in, all out, ladies and gentlemen, there are over 3 160 make model combinations of marketplace. So I think we take a lot for granted being in the industry. You know, I could guess what my next car is going to be, um, but we live in it. We breathe in it uh, every day, day in, day out. A lot of consumers that aren't in our industry, it's pretty ambiguous. It's a pretty tough journey um, to even start these days. And it's not getting any better. I mean, take a look at the 2016. This is a number of new model launches. In 2016, there's over 70 new model launches. It's not getting any better. 2017, you're looking at, again, over 70 new model launches. So I don't think this is changing. It's only getting, again, a little bit more ambiguous as time goes on. And then lastly, you've got fantasy versus reality. Um, we, we've all experienced this. We all know it too well. Uh, the dreamers. You know, I'm allowed to dream as well, Eliana. <laughs> Um, just like uh, Tiffany here with the glasses, in a perfect world, if you told me I had to get a new car three years from now, I'd work real hard, I'd make as much money as I can so I could buy a Ferrari. However, <laughs> then I get hit over the head with a reality stick and, uh, you know, I go home, I talk to my wife, figure out how much money we have down and what we can afford and look at the old piggy bank and I am in the market for more of a Nissan because I've got a 30 mile commute to work and uh, that Ferrari is probably going to get me 8 miles a gallon. So, you know, the fantasy versus reality plays a role as well and I know a lot of our Highline dealers who are, are watching us today can definitely relate to this. So, where does that lead? So, we talked about the old, you know, buying funnel. We talked about what the new funnel looks like. This is what the new funnel looks like. This is uh, this is a, uh, a document from uh, Google. It's a recent uh, release that they had, uh, the Path to Purchase study. And if you haven't seen it, um, we'll have a link later on in this, uh, this uh, broadcast where you can download it. It's really interesting. You know, Google follows uh, consumers and they did a study. Um, right here in this example, you see the little green guy um, on the left-hand side of the screen and they start their search on Google. And they'll do uh, 24 different touch points on average before pulling the trigger and burning gas in a car, of which 19 are digital. So you've got a consumer searching on Google. They're visiting an OEM website right out of the gate. You get that, OE, that lead from your OEM. Uh, further down the road, they're watching a video ad. Now they're back online. They're locating a dealer from their mobile device. They're reading consumer reviews. It's interesting, if, as you work your way to the right side of the, uh, the, the graph here, 
even after the consumer visits a dealership, a lot of them are picking up their cell phones, whether they're outside of F&I or outside of the showroom, and they are on their mobile device. We call this showrooming. And a lot of the times the consumer will say, oh, I'm just checking with my wife, I'm just checking with my, with my son or what have you. The, the, the truth of the matter is they're online seeing if they can get a better deal or if they're, just, or they're making sure that they want to rule out last minute that F-150 that they were considering buying. So you know, it's important to note that um, a lot of people over the years, a lot of dealers have uh, talked about leads as, oh, those are low funnel leads or those are high funnel leads. Even a high funnel lead could easily be a low funnel lead or vice versa. Again, you've got to get the picture of the funnel out of your head and um, take this graph into consideration. So where's the journey led? The journey has led to more hours online. Um, Eliana, I'll never forget, I, I spoke at a, a driving sales event back in 2013, and I was jumping up and down on stage saying, ladies and gentlemen, can you believe that consumers now spent up to 14 hours online? And that blew us all away. Here we are three short years later, and we're looking at just shy of 17 hours online. Wow. Uh, the consumers are visiting. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, they're spending a lot of times online, and unfortunately, less time in the dealerships. Where but they're doing it over a course of like you know two months, three months, because that's how long the buying cycle is, right? You hit the nail on the head, and we're actually going to go into the buying cycle here in a second. Um, no, you. you're absolutely right. <laughs> over a 30, 60, 90 day period, uh, consumers are online. But again, when they used to visit five, six dealerships uh, just 10 years ago. Today, ultimately, they're visiting, I've heard all kinds of numbers. Um, I don't want to be the guy that says it's 1.2 or 1.3. I've heard anything from 1.2 to 1.7, 1.8. So let's agree that consumers, on average, are visiting one to two dealers before pulling the trigger. So you know, there's a nugget there. If you can get the consumer into your dealership, that's, that's the big part of the game today. Um, you know, back in the day, you get them into the dealership. On average, they're going to go ahead and skip around to four other dealerships. So it really is the old saying, get them in. It's never been more important. So 71% are not fully decided. Um, I've heard a, a higher stat than this. You know, NADA told us last year that 80% of the consumers will ultimately buy something different than they originally intended. Um, Google tells us it's 71. Let's just agree that it's the majority of the consumers start out with a make or a model and ultimately buy something different. Now, NADA also told us, reminded us, because this has been a stat for years now, that the number one reason for lost sales in 2015 was because the consumer was set on the wrong car. The car, newer used car associate was trying to sell the consumer the wrong car. A car that uh, they ultimately purchased another car that that dealer very well may have had an inventory, but they were set on the wrong car because they didn't conduct a needs analysis to truly understand what the consumer wanted. So it's something to keep in mind. So where does it lead? Ironically, to your point, Eliana, it's a quicker purchase. We've been talking about stats for many, many years now, and the buy cycle, when I started with the company, uh, doctors and lawyers own, own compu uh, computers back in the 1990s, right? And a doctor or a lawyer would submit a purchase request to auto buy tell the buy cycle would be somewhere between two and three days. It was amazing. Uh, we'd send a lead to a dealer. Back then, we faxed the leads to the dealers. And these consumers would ultimately pull the trigger within days. And for years and years and years, we watched that buy cycle get longer and longer and longer. Google has told us for the first time that buy cycle is actually, despite all the information, Right? These consumers spending more time online, less dealerships, they're actually pulling the trigger quicker than they have before. 89% of purchases are made within that 90-day buy cycle. That's up from, uh, from 83% um, just two years ago. 69% of these consumers are pulling the trigger within 30 days. So when I'm in dealerships, I always hear, well, you know, it's not a race, it's a marathon, we've got to follow up with these consumers 30, 60, 90 days. That still is true, even after 90 days, even after the consumer may have bought, I would encourage dealers to continue to follow up for years, because you got your average lease these days is only two or three years to begin with. Why not sell that consumer the second time around if you missed the sale the first time around? But it's important to uh, take into consideration, there's a lot of points being scored in the first quarter, meaning Within those first 30 days, again, 69% of the consumers are pulling the trigger versus 57% just two years back. Here is uh, an, uh, an example. Here's that, an example that, of a... That. <laughs> yeah, yeah just, just hang in there with me. This is a search string from Google. 
Um, you know, again, Google had this in their path to purchase study. It just shows that the first thing this consumer typed in when they were looking for a vehicle was Toyota. This is a consumer that lived in uh, that lives in South Florida. He started out with a Toyota. Everything in green here is actually the brand that he ended up purchasing, he or she. So you can see that this consumer looked at a Jeep, typed in Jeep again, and then went on and on and on, looked at Ferraris, that he but just like me, looked at Mazdas, Toyotas, <laughs> Nissan, Subarus, and so forth. And then you can see he got a little hot on Jeep again towards the middle, and then once again defected to Chevy, Nissan, Subaru, Toyota. Ultimately, towards the end, he's, he or she is set on Jeep, right? Jeep, Miami, Florida, um, South Florida Jeep, visiting the OEM website, even though a little bit there, towards the end, he was looking at Dodges, um, went to uh, the Planet Dodge website, ultimately this consumer ended up pulling the trigger on the Jeep. But I thought this was an interesting slide because you can actually see the journey that the consumer goes through. And it's definitely not the old funnel experience. It's the all over the board 360 degree experience. So having said that, Eliana, I think it's time for a poll question. I would love it. Audience, guess what? We have not one, but two poll questions for you today. The first one is on your screen now. And of course, as always, we would love it if you'd get involved with our poll questions. It lets us know how smart you are. <laughs> Just kidding. It lets us know what's happening at your dealership. <laughs> so here we go. First question is on the screen now. The question is, of the people who visit a dealership website, what percentage do you think actually leave a footprint? Please select one of the following answers. Do you believe it's 1%? 3%, 7%, 15%, or do you believe it's a whopping 20%? So we want to know, on average, average dealership website, is that correct? That's the question we're asking, Scott? That's correct, and it doesn't, and just a, a disclaimer, it doesn't take into consideration phone calls. So specifically, of the consumers that come to a website, how many of them leave a footprint, meaning how many of them convert, whether it's it be via a, uh, yeah, basically to a lead, so it fills out a credit app, a five-liner, um, a trade-in module, anything, you know, basically leaves a footprint. Okay, we're still waiting for a lot of votes to come in. So while those votes are coming in, I just wanted to throw this comment out to you that came in from Bruce. He says, it's such a paradox of choice. Um, the paradox of choice is very much in play. Consumers can't seem to make up their minds when everything is always being thrown at them. That's Bruce's opinion. They eventually make up their mind, Bruce, <laughs> at some point. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's tough. It, it's tough. You know, as we're hanging out for questions here, you know, it's uh, I started out in retail in the 1990s. Eliana, I remember, I guess the internet was around, but we definitely didn't have computers on the desk. Um, we lived uh, off of the phone and floor ups. And uh, what makes it tough is, again, consumers are shopping, but they're not doing it in front of us as they did. I mean, when I sold cars, it, it, it was easy. You know, today it's tough. It's, uh, it's ambiguous. It's a tough journey. And the consumer's not doing it in front of us. They're, they're, they're doing it in the comfort of their own home. Yes, okay. Um, you know what? Almost everyone has voted. So, Scott, if you're ready, we're going to see who has the right answers because you know what? It's all over the board, these answers. My goodness. There's no one clear winner. So, hopefully, you'll let us know what the right answer There is a right answer to this, correct? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> see, audience, thank you so much for being amazing and answering this first poll question. All right, we're going to share the results right now. 13% of today's audience believe it's only 1% of people who visit a website that actually leave a digital footprint. 18% of today's audience believe it's more like 3%. The majority, 33% of today's audience, so a solid one-third of today's audience, believe it's as high as 7%. A quarter of today's audience think it's about 15%. And then the remaining 13%, well, they think it's 20% of online shoppers that visit your website convert to a digital footprint. So there is no one really standout answer, but there's research on this, right? And you have the answer for us? I do, I do. And remember, it's an average. Um, if there is a dealer out there that's converting 15 or even 20%, I need to meet you. Please email me, text me, call me <laughs> after this webinar. I need to know what you're doing. Um, I agree. Again, all the practices <laughs> that we're going to go over here in a little bit, 
should definitely help you convert. But again, when you when you when you um, take out the phone calls, you're only looking at on average three percent. So three out of a hundred consumers on average will come to your website and leave a footprint. Now more people will chat, but a lot of people that chat don't leave their phone and their email behind, right? They don't leave their contact. So when we say footprint, they leave enough information behind for them to become a lead, for them to become a prospect that the dealer in turn can then follow up with. Um, we see three, and it hasn't really changed over the years. Again, we're going to jump into it as far as how to increase that number, but if there's a dealer on the phone anywhere near 15 or 20 percent, where out of 100 consumers that come to your website, you're gaining the contact info and converting 20 out of 100, that's huge. That is tremendous, and I congratulate you. Um, but and I, wanted, I want you basis, on my show. That's what I... <laughs> Well, no, I want to learn from you. I, I want to I learn from you. I mean, if we can double your, on average, for the people that are, are viewing this over the next 30 to 60 days, if we can double the conversion um, and get you guys to a 6 7%, you are, you are two times better than average. But again, if there's somebody at 15 20% today, please call me, I, I, just, just so I can learn. <laughs> and me, and me too. Thank you. <laughs> All right, keep going. All right. So, just to recap again, before we, uh, we we talked about the poll question, you know, again, what's happened? What's going on? Why is the behavior changing? We talked about the funnel. Um, so, all in, all out, ladies and gentlemen, that has got us to where we are today with what we and Google call the merry-go-round effect. So, think of this merry-go-round as the internet, right? And you've got these horses. Remember what that slide said a couple minutes ago. Out of the 24 different touch points, you've got 19 which are digital. 17, which are websites. So think of this, mer of this merry-go-round and think of these horses as websites. So you got website A, you got website B, and hopefully you've got your website, aka you've got your horse in the race, right? Hopefully you're one of those horses because as a consumer is looking for a Ford in Miami and you're a Ford dealer in Miami, the goal is to get that consumer to your website. If you're not getting the consumer to your website, I can tell you on average the consumer is probably not just driving in as they once prominently did years and years ago. You're out of the race. You're, you're, you're not even showing up, right? So goal number one, get that consumer on your horse. Get that consumer to your website. Um, as important, you've got to get the consumer off of your website. You've got to convert them. Again, if only one in three if only 3% of 100 are converting today, we're going to go through some tactics here in a minute to not only get consumers to your website, but to convert those consumers. So let's talk about the number one goal, getting traffic to your website. This is old news. You've got SEO. You've got SEM. Eliana knows all about this. She works for a website company. Traditional media. You want relevant content. This is nothing new. I didn't teach anybody anything in the last 10 seconds. This is what you guys know. Some new strategies that are in the marketplace that I wanted to talk about are Facebook, Twitter, and vertical advertising. You know, Facebook, it's amazing. Yes, I have a Facebook account. and I want to say years ago, but it hasn't even been that long where maybe you saw an ad or two. Today, it's inundated with ads. A lot of the ads you can't even tell. They look like posts from your friends or what have you. Um, but it is a great place to advertise. It is where a lot of people are going for facts and opinions. Hey, I'm looking to buy a Nissan Sentra. Does anybody have any opinions? It's a great place to advertise. Twitter as well, advertising is becoming quite popular. Um, if any of you guys have a Twitter account, you've probably noticed recently that there's a lot of spots where you can advertise. What I wanted to go and in, uh, delve into a little bit more that a lot of people may not be familiar with is vertical advertising. So vertical advertising is advertising that's dedicated to delivering advertising to a specific audience. For example, for an automotive vertical, uh, vertical advertising is advertising to an audience who specifically conducts an automotive search. So maybe they're on one of these third-party sites, um, but the, the, the bottom line is you need to fish where the fish are. And if there are consumers on third-party sites, no matter where they are in this journey, uh, you've got to have a rod in the water, right? You've got to have a hook in the water so you can play in the game. Because again, not to sound like a broken record, but the consumers, you're not going to get these consumers walking by your dealership today as you, as you once could. So here's an example, ladies and gentlemen, um, of getting the traffic, fishing where the fish are. This is a consumer on a third-party site. It really doesn't matter which one there are. There's a lot of third-party sites out there today, and this is becoming more and more prominent. Uh, this is a consumer that's looking for a uh, Chevrolet Corvette. So this is a consumer who has already put in their zip code. They've already depicted their make and their model. And this is a consumer today through vertical advertising that you can acquire to your websites. 
you know, it's kind of ironic. Everybody's fighting for traffic, and fighting for placement. There are companies out there today that are willing to send traffic from their website to your website to give the consumer more options and to help convert the consumer to leave a footprint. Here's another example. Um, let's just say the consumer's looking for a Chevrolet Silverado. Um, and they want to go a little bit further in the, in the process. I know it's small, I apologize for that, but on the top picture, you'll see this consumer has three choices. They could go to another third-party site there on the bottom, or they could choose one or two of the dealers in the area. Now, what's really cool is dealers have the ability to bid on this consumer, but they also have the ability to bid on different brands. Right? They also have the ability to conquest. So I would imagine a Chevrolet consumer in this area, which is Atlanta, Georgia, where the consumer resides, remember they put in their zip, I would imagine a Chevy dealer would be very, very interested in this consumer who's already been researching the Silverado Crew Cat. However, having said that, a Ford dealership in Atlanta may also be very interested in this consumer who's looking at the Silverado because there are other options to advertise to these consumers is to try to put a TV commercial out there right during a football game and maybe there's somebody that might be interested in a pickup truck but this is a very relevant targeted strategy in where the consumer can go after this um, go uh, the dealer can go after this consumer furthermore if you guys are already dealing with any vertical advertising you want to make sure that it's nimble um, a lot of, I, I've heard a company out there, they pride themselves on t uh, sending traffic to your VDPs, and that's not a bad thing at all. But remember, with this, uh, the buying funnel that looks more like a funnel cake today, you don't want to pigeonhole yourself down to one vehicle. So let's use this for an example. Let's say Gus in Atlanta is looking for a Silverado Crew Cab. Do you really want to take him and just throw him on one of your Silverado Crew Cab pages, which is a VDP? You're probably going to see a really high bounce rate. Because again, what we've hopefully learned here over the past couple minutes is the consumer might want a pickup truck, might want a four-wheel drive, might want a two-wheel drive. We find that a really good practice is to throw them right on the SRP page. It's like, Eliana, it's like going to a restaurant having one thing on the menu. There's, a, there's probably a high bounce rate. People <laughs> go to steakhouses to also many times order fish. Even though it's not a fish house, it's a steakhouse. So you want to give those consumers, when you do buy the traffic and or acquire the traffic, and give them the flexibility to look at other things on the menu. Heck, you might even want to send them to your special page if it's the end of the month and you've got a uh, you know a zero percent or something like that. Why not broadcast that? Or if there's something special that your dealership's doing, um, you should have the flexibility of sending this to consumers and being a bit nimble and allowing them to go to a specific page on your website. So, in recap. You want to fish where the fish are. You've got consumers on third-party sites that are looking for more information. You want to be flexible. You want to have the ability to not only conquest different makes. If you're a Toyota dealer and you're selling Camrys, I would imagine you'd probably be interested in a consumer that's looking at a Honda Accord. So you want to have the flexibility. There's many ways to generate traffic. Um, you definitely want the flexibility of sending them to specific targeted areas on your website as well. Don't just settle for a company that's going to say, we'll send it to your VDP. I'm telling you, it's, it's, you're, you're selling yourself short, and you've probably got a high bounce rate. And technology. you know, Again, technology allows us to do this. Uh, this technology wasn't around years ago. It allows us to conquest and engage with high intent I'm not going to say low funnel because there really is no such thing as low funnel in today's world, but high intent consumers who may be anywhere in that 360 degree shopping experience. But as we learn, these consumers are pulling the trigger quicker than before, so why not capitalize on them? Okay, so we talked about getting the traffic to your website. Again, if we're going to use the merry-go-round analogy, getting a consumer on your horse, so to speak, how do we convert them? So knowing that three out of 100 consumers convert on average, not taking into consideration consumers who call in, you've got best practices, you've got chat, you've got a quick response time, you've got videos. Again, everybody knows this. This is uh, chat I think came out in the 1990s. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it really works. I've got nothing against chat. I'm a big fan of chat. Um, but two other strategies that I wanted to um, introduce, if uh, some folks haven't heard of them yet, are a virtual showroom technology and an inbound, outbound, compliant texting strategy. Um, you know, I read articles, it seems weekly in automotive news, the millennials are coming, the millennials are coming. Pretty soon they're going to make up for the majority of the people that are buying cars. Yeah, it's actually, we, just, we just had Corey Mosley on 
we just had Corey Mosley on uh, last week, and he talked about how to sell to millennials because they're going to be taking over like next year. There's going to be the seismic shift. It's not going to be the baby boomers. It's going to be the millennials that are going to be the majority buying generation. Mr. Mosley, and I'm honored to have uh, watched all 90 minutes last week with Mr. <laughs> Mosley. Um, no, I agree, and, and Corey knows this. Corey and I uh, have known each other for years. I've been talking about this for a while, but it goes a little bit further than just talking about the millennials. Um, my mother's 75 years old. She lives in Pompano Beach, Florida, which is a little town just uh, north of Fort Lauderdale. And Eliana, for the past couple of years, when I need to get in touch with my mother, I don't email her. I don't call her. I text her. And it's really the only way I can get a quick response. My mother is not a millennial. She's nowhere near a millennial. So You're despite right. the millennial the same thing. thing. Like, if I call her, she doesn't pick up. But if I text her, answers me right away. What is it with the older yeah. generation and the texting? They love it. <laughs> they, send you straight to, they send you straight to voicemail, but you get a text. What do you want? Right? Absolutely. Busy. Absolutely. But it's amazing. I, I mean, me as well. You know, I, I could, uh, uh, if I'm in a meeting or if I'm at work, I'm texting all day long. Think of all those consumers that you're trying to get in touch with, right? You're calling these leads and they're getting harder and harder to get on the phone. What the lead came from your website, an OEM website, a third party, it doesn't matter. Um, you're trying to get these consumers on the phone, but you've got to realize most BDCs are open from what? Eight to five. Well, unfortunately, eight to five is when most people work. You know, I would uh, definitely entertain uh, dealerships around the, the country to set hours six, seven, eight o'clock at night. If they aren't today, there's a, there's a nugget there because you're getting a lot of people when they're a lot more accessible. But if you try calling me between eight and five, it's tough. I will always 100% see every single person that texts me between the hours of eight and five. And it's probably going to be within one or two minutes versus a phone call. Voicemails, I can't tell you the last time I listened to my voicemails. It's embarrassing to say it, but... Needless to say, I want to talk a little bit about texting, um, and I want to talk about virtual showrooms. So again, the idea is to get the consumer, once they're on your horse, so to speak, to get them off of your horse. So they're not looking at any other websites, so you give them everything you need while they're on your website to ultimately convert them, get them into the dealership, and ultimately, hopefully, sell them a car. So a virtual showroom technology, um, Eliana Chats up, a Chat has evolved. Uh, you know, chat again was invented in the 1990s. Chat is that little box where you type in your question and the dealer responds. Or a lot of times, it's uh, somebody out of Orlando or uh, you know a, uh, a different country and they're and they're responding. Um, chat's evolved to no different than I guess what everybody can relate to is a FaceTime on your iPhones, right? And the very first thing I learned when you, when I started in this business in the 1990s, you've got to make a friend before you make a sale, right? The, the, the industry that we're all in, it's a race to the relationship. As these consumers are hopping around websites, as they're going from dealer, as they once did go from dealer to dealer, um, people buy things from people who they trust. They'll even pay a little bit more money. You'll even get a little more gross on the front end if you have a trusting relationship and they like you versus they're hating you because you came off the wrong way. Virtual technology is a really good way to gain that relationship that's a, a lot harder to do because we're not face-to-face. -face. Just because the consumer is in the comfort of their own home doesn't mean we can't be face-to-face. -face. So this is an example of a, uh, a chat, so to speak, um, where the chat can very well start out as that little box in the corner where the consumer's typing in and the dealer's writing back. And what we think of best practice is, what we preach to our dealers is, the dealer should ask that consumer, can I upgrade the conversation where you don't have to type so much and type vigorously, can we have a voice to voice? And there should be, in your chat provider, the option now, the technology's been there, for the consumer or the dealer to sit into the computer, just like we're doing on this webinar. Furthermore, to then upgrade the, the um, relationship even a little bit more, Mr. or Mrs. Consumer, would you mind if I turned on my camera? A lot of my consumers like putting a face with a name, and no consumer is going to have a problem with this. So now I turn on my, cam my webcam, just like we did earlier, to, again, kind of make it a little bit more personal with the audience so they can see who they're, they're hearing. And uh, furthermore, to completely evolve the conversation, the consumer then has the ability. Now, look where we're at. We're having a face-to-face -face conversation. Your dealership is interacting with this consumer as they once did 15, 20 years ago when they're on the lot. The vast majority of your competitors are not doing this. And again, I'll, I'll end with where I started. People buy things from people who they like and they know. And if you can engage the consumer this way with the relationship online, you're definitely ahead of the game. So that's kind of the virtual technology. 
Um, something else your chat provider should be providing, um, this goes back 10, 15 years, this technology, you should know where these consumers are based off of IP address. Uh, based on an IP address, nine times out of 10, it should be exact. Uh, one time out of 10, it does get sometimes a little wacky. But if you're chatting with a consumer and you're in the DC area, and this consumer is in Iowa or San Francisco, and then you've got another consumer that seems you're interested, and now you're juggling, well, who do I talk to? Well, if the other consumer's IP address is a mall from your dealership, and the other guy's out in San Francisco, put the guy in San Francisco on, on hold and work with this consumer who, who could probably be at your dealership within two or three minutes. So again, just to recap, you should know and your chat provider should have the technology to show you where these consumers are as you proactively reach out to them. Now for my favorite topic, I've actually done presentations on this just alone over the years, um, texting. Again, the predominant means to communicate today, uh, whether it's my mom in Florida, Eliana, your mom, wherever she may be, uh, New Jersey, I guess correct? Actually, she's, she's just outside of Philadelphia, but yeah. Philly. West Philadelphia, born and raised. Um, On the playground you know, is where I spent most of my days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, texting, texting, texting. I love to text. I think it is a great avenue to engage incremental consumers and gain a relationship. Here's an example of a, a very oversimplified concept take a line of code, put it on your mobile website, your desktop site, and allow consumers to text you. Whether it's my mom, your mom, they're a lot more prone to text in their question to convert rather than to pick up the phone and, and dial a dealership. Now these three examples are indeed mobile websites. Shame on me, I should have made one of the examples a, a desktop website because I would challenge everybody that's on this webinar. Most of you guys are probably in front of a, a PC at your desk in your office. Look down and to the right. What do you see? Your cell phone. Everybody on this webinar <laughs> probably has their cell phone right next to them. So you don't have to be on a mobile site in order to text. Although it's the primary means of communication on a mobile on a mobile device, um, even when you're on your desktop, you know if I can't speak. I can probably text. And, and think of your service consumers too, when you can't get in touch with the consumer, when you've got their car up on the lift, um, it's a great way to interact with them is texting. Now you'll also notice that I kept that chat uh, um, example in there. I love chat, I really do. Um, if you don't have chat, I recommend it. It doesn't matter who your provider is, just the ability for consumers to convert. But if you have seen as well, I'm not saying replace chat with texting, I'm saying add texting, the texting option, the texting feature on your website, and also have the chat there. You'll see that you're not cannibalizing your chats in any way. But there's a few benefits to texting versus chat. First of all, response time. Um, Eliana, if I'm on a website and I have a question and I put in a chat and I don't get a response within 10 to 15 seconds, how do you think I feel? Non-important. Yeah, a little lonely, a little deserted. <laughs> how about 25, 30 seconds goes by? Give me an adjective to describe how you think I feel. Uh, I have now at that point given up and now I am moving on to someplace else who will be able to service me because I want instant well, gratification. Yeah, I'm a little bit more patient than you. Um, I, I'm going to bail after about 40 <laughs> seconds, but at the 30 second mark, I'm angry, right? I'm depressed. I've got anxiety. These people don't want my business. And then 40 seconds, just like you, I'm gone. I'm on to another um, horse on the carousel, so to speak. That's why dealers are hopping or consumers are hopping around. Now replace that conversation with chat or with uh, text rather. So now let's start all over in the example. Let's say I texted in a question. Let's just use a real life example. Hey, hey Eliana, I've got a question on the webinar. Let's say I texted you at one o'clock this afternoon after the webinar. If I don't hear back from you within 30 seconds, am I sad, depressed, angry, and have anxiety? No. <laughs> no, it's completely acceptable. It's amazing. You could text me back four or five minutes later and it's completely acceptable. I don't think any less of you. And I'm going to hang out for four or five minutes and wait for you to text me back. I'm asking the same question. I'm just asking it through a different means of communication. And text gives the dealers flexibility to not have to respond back within 13 seconds. And what's really cool, this always happens to me around NADA. I go to NADA, I make all these new relationships, and uh, I, I get a texting relationship with whether it be vendors or dealers or what have you. It's so funny because then the next year at NADA, I'll have somebody that I met a year ago text me back. And how do I know that I met them? Because that chain picks up 12 months later exactly where it left off. 
And that's another big, big benefit of texting. When a consumer, maybe the first day they're in the market for a vehicle, texts the dealership and has questions on that Jeep Cherokee, that dealer might receive a text back 60 days later and they start off right where they left off. Chat doesn't allow you to do that. So it, it, there is a big benefit of texting in addition to chat to help convert a lot of these consumers when they're on your course, on the carousel, so to speak, on your website. Uh, texting, you know this, I, I've spent a lot of time in the industry at, at, at different events. NADA had our, our company speak um, uh, last year in San Francisco strictly about compliance. I got to spend nine hours in, in Washington, D.C. with the NADA lawyers, and we went through every possible example to make sure we were on the same page because we were just about to stand up in front of tens of thousands of dealers and tell them what's compliant and what's not. So wow. it really comes down to two things, texting compliance. You want to make sure the consumers opted in and you want to make sure the consumer has the option to opt out. It's that simple. Um, I, I always like stories to relate it to. Think about, ladies and gentlemen, the last time you flew, you went to an airport, you went to that kiosk, and it's American Airlines, and the last thing that, that kiosk asked you, Mr. Peckstein, should your flight be delayed, there would be a gate change, or should your flight be canceled? How would you like us to communicate with you? Email, phone, or text. If you guys are anything like me, you chose the text option. What's the very next thing that happened? The uh, phone starts vibrating, right? I was going to say, The phone yeah. starts vibrating. It, it actually, it's ironic because it holds up the lines at the airport. You have an elderly couple up there and, oh, Pearl, your, your phone's ringing. Oh, who's calling me at a time like this at 6 in the morning? It's the airline. It's their opt-in. Go ahead and respond back with a Y or a yes. They just want to make sure that they have a written uh, express consent that they could text you regarding the changes of your flight. And you'll notice also on all of those messages that the consumer has the option to opt out with the words end, quit, unsubscribe, cancel. Um, Lithia actually got in a little bit of trouble years ago because they had a system that wasn't adhering to the opt-outs. I don't want to bore you guys with all the lawsuits, but there are a ton of them, and typically they're in multi-million dollars uh, because the FCC tells us it's up to $1,500 per infraction. What? It sure does add up. Yeah, up to $1,500 per uncompliant text, non-compliant text. So we're going to talk about really quick here, um, the, the point of the screen, if you are texting, ladies and gentlemen, make sure it's compliant. There are texting solutions in the market today. Make sure you're using one of them. Uh, the dangers in texting with, from a, uh, a sales associate's cell phone to a consumer, there, there's, a lot of, it's, there's a lot of problems. First of all, we are unfortunately cursed with the highest turnover of employees in any industry in, in North America. Um, all in, all out, 60 to 70 percent of our personnel on the sales floor specifically will turn over the course of a year. So if, if sales associates are texting consumers when they do leave, which the majority of them on average do over the course of a year, they're taking all those relationships with them. Furthermore, we've spent decades at getting good at getting all the information into the CRM. Texting comes about and dealerships took a big, gigantic step backwards where now none of this information is making it into the CRM. So, you know, there, there's a couple reasons you want to be, uh, you want a texting solution. You want to be compliant. You want to make sure all the information is making it into the CRM. And uh, you want to make sure these, these uh, relationships aren't uh, going with the sales associate when they go across the street and instead of working for Honda, now they're trying to sell all those Honda consumers Toyotas. So I've got a quick little homework assignment, a little test, if you will. Um, again, you want to have a consumer opt in and opt out. Here's just a conversation that could take place in your dealership today. Uh, let's just call this a lead that came in from Autotrader, cars.com, your OEM, your website. It doesn't matter where the lead came from. Uh, couldn't get you on the phone, so what does a dealer do? They text them. Hey, I just got your request for a record. When can you come in? Now, notice the date. It's, it's August 28th. 2014. It was a real conversation, by the way. So uh, there's a holiday approaching, right? You've got Memorial, or what is it, Labor Day. So the dealer writes back a couple minutes later, hey, we're having a huge Labor Day sale this weekend. Come on in, ask for Steve. A couple days goes by. Now it's after Labor Day. It's September 2nd. Hey, I, I didn't see you over the weekend. Did, did, you, did you come in? When could you come in? The consumer here writes back, stop. The dealer writes back, D do you mean you stop by? Consumer writes back, quit. Did somebody tell you I quit? Oh, my gosh. Help, help me with the math, guys. It's up to $1,500. So first of all, that first text was not compliant. That's $1,500, up to a $1,500 fine. Second text, $1,500. Third text, $1,500. So on and so on. Oh That's $7,500 in one sitting. Let's assume this happened on a daily basis. Let's assume the string was over the course of one day. Now let's assume you've got 10 sales associates doing this on a daily basis. 
10 sales associates, $7,500 a day, or it would be $75,000 a day, that's over $2 million in, over the course of one month. So, you know, there's a lot of cases out there that have already settled. Most of them do settle. It's not the FCC that are suing these dealerships and these other companies like Domino's, Timberland & Co. I'm not going to go down the, the, the gamut as far as all these companies that have already got sued. It's consumers. It's consumers putting together the easiest and quickest class action lawsuits that we've seen in some time. You've got that out-of-work lawyer or maybe a lawyer that wants to uh, retire a little bit early. Um, it is very easy, and there are options all over the place uh, to throw little class action suits together. And if up to fifteen hundred dollars per infraction, they do get really, really costly. So you want to be you want to be very, very careful if you've got uh, newer used car associates texting from their personal devices. So just to wrap it up, text, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, you want to place that text us button on your website. You know, a lot of people say, Scott, I'm already texting today. I'm compliant. I'm doing it on my CRM. But it goes a little bit further than that. You want, the, you want to give the consumer the ability to interact with you. Um, it's like cold texting versus uh, working leads. I'd rather work somebody. I'd rather work with a consumer who's texted me to begin with where I know I'm not bothering them by texting them back versus just sitting in my CRM texting all day, right? Uh, you want to implement a lead management system with opt-ins and opt-out capabilities. You want to make sure you're compliant. And something that's relatively new, um, there is now technology that enables you to text your landlines. So there's a lot of consumers today that are probably already texting your landline. If you guys are anything like me, when you see a missed call, I always just send them that custom text back saying, can't talk, I'll call you in a bit. And a lot of uh, people are texting when they see a missed call from the dealership. They're just texting them back, assuming that it is a cell phone or it's text enabled. So I would encourage you guys, it's very, very cheap, to text enable at least your main, your main line and see the people who are already texting you. And then it's as easy as just changing your marketing and saying instead of on the billboard, on the radio, on the TV where it says call us today, I would just throw in that word or text us. Give these, especially these millennials, give them the option to text you and they will text you. And if your competition isn't giving them that option, Guess who's getting all these these inquiries? Guess who's converting all these consumers? It's you over your over your uh, competition. Let's take a break. Let me take a break, Eliana. We've got another poll question, don't we? Yes, we do. Last poll question is on the screen now, audience. We'd love to see if you know the answer to this one. Based on Autobytel data backed by Google, of consumers who submitted a new car lead, what percentage defected? and then bought a used car instead. Which one do you think it is? Do you believe it's 25%? Do you believe it's 40% of consumers? 55% of consumers? Do you think it's as much as 60% of consumers who submitted a new car lead and then instead bought a used car? Or do you think it's the last answer, which is, what? They wanted a new car. Why would they buy a used car? My point exactly. All right. So once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close the poll and share the results. So we want to know, based on Autobytel data backed by Google of consumers who submitted a new car lead and then bought a car, what percentage of those consumers defected and instead bought a used car? Do you think it's 25%, 40%, 55%, or do you think it's up to 60% or no, that's not possible. They wanted a new car. They're buying a new car. There's no way they would turn around and get a used car. Come on. Let's be real. <laughs> and I want to remind everyone we're going to be nearing the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions for our first time dealer on webinar presenter, Scott Peckstein, get those questions in. We're going to be getting to the Q&A session in just a few minutes, I think. Right, Scott? Yeah, we're, we're, we're almost wrapped up. Almost there. All right. Audience, thank you so much for your awesome answers. Scott, if you're ready, I'll close this poll and share the results. Yeah, please do. All right. Let's do it. Okay. 19% of today's audience think it's the first answer, 25%. The majority, however, 50% of my audience, half of my audience today, think it's as high as 40%. 16% think it's 55%. 9% think it's as high as 60%, and then the last 6% will there with me. They're like, what? They wanted a new car. Why would they buy a used car? <laughs> so, Scott, is there a right answer to this? And there, there obviously is. you got data on this, right? Yeah, we sure do, Eliana. we got some smart cookies on the line today. So it's 40%. The majority of the, uh, the group is right. 
Um, you know, the, the, why I, I, I put this up here, ladies and gentlemen, is you know when you're in the dealership on any given Sunday and 10 people walk through the door for a new Honda and three or four ultimately burn gas in a used car, none of us are surprised. If anything, we're excited. We made a little bit more money probably on the front and the back end. Um, a lot of times with internet leads, cons uh, dealers get in the mindset where they get pigeonholed into the exact not only make and model which the consumer submitted, but even the trim. And again, the whole point of today, consumers need more help than ever. It's, uh, it's more confusing than, than ever for them. So give them the, the menu, give them those options, and definitely talk about used car with your new car consumers because of those who buy, we see four out of 10 ultimately going to used. So that brings me to one of my last points here. I, I got to challenge everybody's sales process. You know, the things that we've learned from trainers years and years ago, a lot of it's still relevant. A lot of us, a lot of it has made us experts. Um, you know, for instance, why buy for me? Getting back to the consumer with a vehicle of interest, that hasn't changed. Everybody should have a powerful why buy for me message, especially if you're a Toyota dealer in Atlanta and there's 11 other Toyota dealerships in Atlanta, what makes you unique? Um, but what I wanted to really stress today is you got to sell your brand. Um, again, if you're a Toyota dealership in, in Atlanta, your competition isn't the other Toyota dealerships. It's Honda, it's Kia, it's Hyundai. Um, you know, if you're a BMW dealer, for instance, and you get a 3 Series lead, um, sell your dealership, that's great, but also sell the brand. You know, our BMW 3 Series has a 4-year, 50,000 warranty, which includes maintenance. It includes everything from brake pads to oil changes uh, to windshield wipers. You know, if you're also looking at a Lexus IS and a Mercedes-Benz, i got to tell you, um, even if their payment is $20, $30 less a month, it could easily be made up in just maintenance alone. And then give choices. You know, give that menu. If a consumer submits a request for a Nissan Maxima, right out of the gate, give them a, the special on the Ultima. If a, Toy if a consumer submits a request on a Toyota Camry, talk about the Corolla. Even if they don't want a Corolla and they ultimately buy the Camry, all you're doing is giving them more options. Um, and then lastly, on the used car side, if four out of ten consumers who buy are ultimately going to go used, please give them a link to those 226 used cars you have in, in, um, in inventory, even if they're looking at a 2016 Honda. You know, I'm able to save a lot of my consumers substantial amount of money by looking at a used option. I went ahead and uh, given you some of those options as they may be attractive to you. So the 360 degree shopping experience, uh, just some, some stats that help paint the picture of what we talked about today. Over 50% of the consumers aren't lead loyal to make. 70% uh, aren't lead loyal to model. Again, 40% will submit a new car request and ultimately burn gas in a used car. And don't forget the flip side. If a consumer is looking at a used car, especially with today's interest rates, we see back by our Millions of leads that we send every uh, month, we track all, or every year, we track them all uh, through IHS RL Pulp. We see 17 consumers, Eliana, 17% of the consumers that submit a used car request and buy ultimately burn gas in a new car. So don't what? forget, even with the new, yeah, it's crazy, it's crazy. And, and you know what? If interest rates were at eight, nine percent, I don't know if that would be the case. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of these consumers are, are submitting uh, used car requests and ultimately burning gas in new cars, especially credit challenge consumers. Many times are easier to get in a new car than a used car, as we know. So a quick fun slide, um, you know, lead loyalty by age. When you've got a consumer in your dealership, it's that nursing student that's 20 years old, and they're looking at the $40,000 Acura. You know, the hunch of the salesman is, let me show you some used car options. You're 20 years old, and you just got your first job six months ago. A lot of times on the Internet, we don't know how old the people are. Uh, but to no surprise, older shoppers are more loyal. They've owned more cars. They're more knowledgeable. Their financing typically isn't as much of an issue. They've got established credit, and they aren't influenced as much as, uh, from social media. But the, the point here is we don't know the age of consumers, so we, we can't, uh, we've got to treat all of them equally. So again, just another reason to give those options. Uh, one of my last points, uh, lead, um, purchase behavior as time goes on. You know, it's no surprise the majority of the consumers who submit a request are buying within 30 days. The blue graph uh, depicts the consumers who submitted a new car request and bought new. The green graph uh, reflects the consumers who submitted a new car request and ultimately defected to a used car. But look what happens after day 60. Look what happens after day 90. The propensity for a consumer to defect to a used car skyrockets. Matter of fact, there are more consumers who submit new car requests. There are more consumers buying used at day 90 than they are buying new. So a nugget here is, especially around the 30 the, to the 45 day mark, if you haven't closed a consumer, change the conversation up. That consumer knows that you're the biggest Chevy dealer west of the Mississippi. They know that you've got the biggest Corvette um, uh, inventory west of the Mississippi. You've talked to them about that Corvette for the past 45 days. 
Mr. Consumer, I'm calling you not because of that canary uh, colored Corvette that you were asking about. I'm calling you because I've just got three Mustangs, two Camaros, and uh, I don't know, a Turbo Saab that came in unused. They haven't even made it through detail. I thought of you because I know you're looking for a high-performance vehicle. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you statistically, more consumers will buy used than new at the, after the 45, 60-day mark. And so many of us are just still stressing that new car that they ultimately submitted or that they originally submitted. So in wrapping up, myths versus truth, you know, there's, there's a myth out there. When a consumer submits an internet lead, my competition is my fellow brand. The reality is that consumer is still shopping brands and it's still being finalized. The, the truth is consumers visit, on average, 1.2 dealerships down from 2005. In recapping, you got to drive the traffic. You got to get the consumer on your horse if you want to have a horse in the race. Once they're on your horse, you've got to convert them. You've got to give them what they need. So they stop visiting those other 17 digital, 19 digital touch points. Don't take the lead too literally. Don't get pigeonholed into the make model, especially the trim. When consumers submit leads, they need help. They're basically just saying, hey, I'm in the market. I'm going to buy Then historically you've seen, and um, I just need help. Just engage with me. And lastly, uh, new and used car professionals are more important than ever. I mean, after this presentation, you guys just got a little taste of what it's like to be a consumer. It's more confusing than ever to be a consumer and they need our help. Some suggested resources, Eliana, that uh, folks can, uh, I believe, uh, get the deck. Um, a lot of the stats that I talked about are referenced on these, um, on these links. And just some homework assignments, you know, some action items which you can download as well um, after the presentation. And I believe that comes to an end. Scott Peckstein, you really, really make a girl angry. Why is that? Because I wasted four years not having you on my webinar. What? You were amazing. Excellent, excellent, amazing presentation. Thank you, sir. That was wonderful. We got some questions coming at you from the audience in just a few minutes. And audience, if you haven't gotten in your question yet for our first-time webinar, dealer on webinar presenter, Scott Peckstein from Autobytel, well, I'm waiting for your questions right now. So send them in, and we're going to get to them in just a couple minutes. I want to remind everyone, too, that I'd like you guys to take a moment to check out the handouts section of your GoToWebinar interface in there. You're going to see a helpful handout from Scott Peckstein. Everyone on today's webinar will be able to download Scott Peckstein's slide deck, the one that you just saw. So check out the handout section of your GoToWebinar interface. You can immediately download that now. It will be available until the close of the webinar so make sure you get your hands on that now all right and it's that time if you missed it at the beginning of the webinar well I announced that our good friends over at Auto by Tell, they're giving away an awesome prize today on the webinar three of you lucky webinar attendees are gonna each win $500 of website traffic compliments of Auto by Tell. No, seriously, every dealership could use that. So get ready, get to your keyboards. First person to write in the correct response to one of our giveaway questions is going to be winning this sweet prize today. And as you've already heard what the prize is, certainly if you are a vendor, we're going to ask you to kindly sit this one out. This prize, as you can tell, is intended for dealership personnel only. But we do appreciate you being here every week, and thank you so much. And please never hesitate to come on to a dealer on webinar. We love having you. But for right now, all right, all you dealership personnel, get to your keyboards. Good luck, everyone. First question coming at you now. How many vehicle, make, model combinations exist today? Boom! First person got it right. Oh, a lot of people got it right, but the first person was David Sharp. David, you are on a winning streak, my friend. Darn it. All right, David Sharp, send me all of your information. You know how it goes. Congratulations. David Sharp is our first winner today. Don't worry, audience. David's going to sit this one out, and all the rest of you can try out for the other two prizes. We got two more to give away. David, congratulations. You know what to do. Send me the name of your dealership and all of that great information, address, phone number, email, all that great stuff, okay? All right, audience. Got two more of these prizes to give away. Get to your keyboards. Here we go. Of the 24 average touch points that influence consumer buying behaviors, how many are digital? Again, a first person got it right. I love it. Jeff Ravilla. Ravia. Jeff, 
You know who you are. Jeff, congratulations, dude. You are winner number two. Jeff, tell me what dealership you're from, my friend. I'd love to tell everyone all the good news. And I'm writing your name down. That's it. We're making it official. <laughs> oh, and also where you're from. Oh, okay. So we got David Sharp. He's from Elliott Auto Group in Mount Pleasant, Texas. Jeff Ravia is from Smale Honda in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Congratulations, you two. You guys can sit this one out as well. You guys are already winners today. We got one more prize to give away, audience. Here we go. Good luck, everyone. You can be fined up to how much per non-compliant text? Boom. Three in a row. I love when days like this happen. That's right. $1,500 is the correct response. And Brandy Holmes, you are today's third winner. Congratulations, Brandy Holmes. I think you might be a first-time winner, Brandy. I think maybe Jeff, are you a first-time winner? I'm very, very excited. Anyway. Yay! Congratulations, Brandy. Brandy, right on in. Let me know what dealership you're from, my friend. Would love to find out. Give you a proper congratulations. And I know, I know, we only give away three prizes today. You know what? That's a lot. Usually we only give away one. But you know what? <laughs> we give away cool prizes every week. So don't you worry about it. We are going to give away another prize every time we, you come on to a Dealer On webinar. So come on back for another Dealer On webinar. Who knows? That could be the day you walk away with a really cool prize. Now. I want to thank everyone for playing along. It was a lot of fun. Of course, we've got to say congratulations to our winners, David Sharp from Elliott Auto Group, Jeff Ravia from Smale, and Brandy Holmes from Hair Chevrolet in Noblesville, Indiana. Congratulations, Brandy. First time winner. All right. Um, and of course, we've got to thank our good friends over at Auto by Tell for their incredible generosity. Great job, everyone. All right. But now, we're going to get started with the questions from the audience. I'm going to put my camera on. Hi, everyone. How you doing? Scotty, you can put your camera on if you feel like it. Look how handsome. All right. Here we go. I'm going to uh, scroll up. Oh, by the way, I should tell our winners. I'm sorry, real quick. I should tell our winners. Um, you're going to be hearing uh, directly from our friends over at Auto Buy Tell about claiming your prize. All right. So just wait on over for that. Okay. Scott, we have a lot of comments that came in too, so I'm going to feed those to you in the order in which they were received. First question came in from Tracy, and she says, what is the closing ratio of the auto buy tell leads versus the average website lead? She's putting you on the spot, rate, isn't she? <laughs> uh, the auto buy tell leads versus the average website lead. Uh, average website leads are all over the board. Um, I've seen and heard dealers close their website leads over 20%. Um, I've heard dealers that close the website over 2 or 3%. It really comes down to the process. Um, we track every single request that we send. Again, this year it's going to be over 10 million leads, so it's not a little sample set. It's a lot of leads. And we see, well, we don't see, RO Polk IHS tracks every consumer over the course of 90 days. And that allows us to report back how many consumers bought of the 10 million on an annual basis, uh, what they bought, from whom they bought. Even lately we can see who they financed through. So to answer your question directly, we see about a third of them buy. Now, I wouldn't call that a close rate. I would call that a buy rate. So out of 100 leads that we send to our dealer body, we see about one out of three, are, they're buying something. Um, as far as what the close rate is at a specific dealership, that's a tough question. You know, I want to say 7, 8, 9%. Um, a dealer could come on and very well be at 15%. A dealer could come on and very well be at 2 or 3%. That comes back to the process. It all comes down to the process. Um, but on average, we see about a third buy a vehicle, so that's a buy rate, and on average at the specific dealerships, anywhere between a 7, 8, 9% close rate, but I don't want to discredit dealers are out there closing at 20%, and there are some dealers that close at 2, 3% that are very happy because they're selling, you know, Lexus and Porsche and, and, and Infinity and, and making a, a, a nice bit of gross on those, on those sales. Uh, one out of three is awesome. That's great. It surprised us too. It, it, it did. We've had this relationship with uh, IHS now for a, a number of years, and we really haven't seen the number change that much. Since we started the relationship, we've seen one in three buy, which is why it's so frustrating because we, 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 we talk with our dealers, a third of these people are buying something. Please stay in touch with them. And again, as you guys now know, four out of ten of the new car consumers ultimately burn gas and use cars, so we can't say it enough, especially around day 30, Please get in front of that consumer and sell them one of your 126 used cars because ultimately they're going to go down to an independent 
or somewhere else to buy that car. Right, right, right. Okay, great question, Tracy. Thank you so much for that. All right. Um, next one isn't really a question so much as a statement. We had a lot of people who were writing in and saying, yes, yeah, Scott, and they were doing a rah-rah thing. Okay, so um, Philip, for instance, wrote in. He says, I 100% agree with you not to pigeonhole ads to one specific VDP unless it's a branded model term. Even then, a multi-vehicle on-site SRP page would be better. That one came in from Philip, so thank you so yeah, much. Philip, you hit the nail on the head, and that's something that we recently learned, so you've probably known that for a while, but you're really uh, selling yourself short by giving them, having them come into your restaurant and putting one thing on the menu, right? Right, right. Um, and by the way, I have been to a restaurant where there was only one thing on the menu. <laughs> in and out, right? Actually, no. Um, they have a place called uh, Cheesy Grill, and all they sell are grilled cheeses. That's it. Oh. Done. All right. Um, Philip went on to say, yes, compliant texting solutions are gold. So I just thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> okay. Um, since we are talking about texting, I do want to get to uh, this other question that came in from Alyssa. She says, why can't I just text customers right from my CRM? It's compliant, right? And I know you covered yeah, it a, a little bit, but... Well, it's a really good point. Um, it's a really good point, but that's only half the battle. You know, that's like having a telephone that only uh, makes outbound calls and doesn't have a ringer. So on a Monday morning after a long weekend, does your BDC want to come in and just start cold calling at 8 a.m.? Um, so in other words, cold texting from your CRM, bothering people that might not want to be bothered. Um, how about we change it and we set up inbound strategies, whether that be in your marketing, having consumers text your landline, whether that be putting that button on your SRPs, your VDPs, your service page, your home page. And if you set up a two-way strategy now on 8 o'clock on a Monday morning, mm -hmm. your BDC is going to hopefully be so busy responding to all the leads that have come in versus cold texting. So it just gives you an edge if you've got the text coming in and you have the ability for outbound cold texts, as we would call them. I love it. And Scott, thank you so much for that. Great question, Alyssa. Um, last question, because we are uh, quite a bit over time. Last question came in from Philip. Different Philip, though. More than one Philip. Okay. Um, uh, I, I apologize. Not the last question. Second to last question came in from Philip. What do you think is the important piece of information to give a dealer who is stuck in his own ways? I have to tell you, we get basically that question on every topic, any topic that we do. There are a lot of dealers who found success doing it one way and don't think that maybe they need to change with the times. This is the same thing. You said it yourself. If we don't change, we're not going to make it. So. Oh, what kind of uh, arm bar, figure four leg lock, <laughs> half Nelson <laughs> wrestling move would you recommend to Philip and others like him who have a dealership who's stuck in their ways and doesn't want to change the times? It's tough. It's tough. I'd be more than willing personally to get on the phone with your GM, your owner, what have you. I know a lot of people are stuck in their ways. I am adverse to change uh, personally, you know, but I keep reminding myself the only thing consistent in life is change, right? And uh, <laughs> Five years from now, I don't think this deck of what we talked about, I'm guessing a lot of it might not be relevant, you know. So don't take what you what you take today and apply it to, uh, five years from now. Apply it today. Um, I would just encourage your, your GMs, your owners to, to get up, to leave the dealership, to go to many of these shows. I mean, we have a show that we're meeting up in Florida yeah. uh, this Sunday. I guess, this Sunday? Uh, no, next, next Sunday. Next, next Sunday, now. yes. Women in Automotive. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of very, very intelligent folks out there. I'm not claiming to be one of them, please. Um, <laughs> uh, next week, I, I know you've got a powerhouse. He's a personal friend of mine. We'll talk about him in a minute. But, um, you know, I would just say get get out of your shell. Uh, get your, your dealers out of their shell and, and let them know. Maybe show them a, a recording of this webinar. But, you know, the world is changing. And if you don't change, your competition isn't. They're going to leave you behind. I'm sort of speaking cliches, but I, I don't know if I have an exact answer for you. Um, but um, you got to sell them on change. I mean, I'm not Scott, but I might try a sleeper hold. I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> David Sharp, one of today's winners, he actually uh, had a follow-up comment. He says, change, that is why I'm on the Dealer on webinar every week to keep up with the momentum in the auto business. Thank you so much for that, Sharpie, and thank you for the great question, Philip. Okay, last question before we close out the show, which means you only have a few more minutes to download your copy of Scott Peckstein's awesome webinar deck that he just used. Remember, go to the handout section and download that in the next few minutes, all right? Dan is the last question of the day. He says, Scott, 
Do you have some suggestions what sites sell vertical advertising space, or do you need to use a company to source that advertising to a wide range of websites? There aren't many. There aren't many. Uh, selfishly, we're one of them. It's something that's relatively new with us uh, that came over from an acquisition. Um, you know, we pride ourselves on staying on the cutting edge. Back in 1995, our model was actually cutting edge. Um, so we're continuing to evolve. Um, we're one of them that I, I, I would recommend. Uh, there are others that are known, but you just got to be careful. Um, you know, there's one prominent one out there, but I think it was either David Sharp or it was David Sharp that commented earlier. You got to be really, really careful if somebody's trying to sell you traffic and then put it on your VDP. I know I said it already, um, but again, just think menu, unless you want grilled cheese, I think <laughs> all your customers want grilled cheese, you've got to give them those options. So. I can say, you know, um, modestly, we're one of them. We're one of them, um, and I think they're becoming more and more prominent um, because it's becoming quite popular. When when a third party isn't converting a consumer, they like to give the consumers options too. We like to practice what we preach and also give that menu. Maybe not every consumer wants to come to our websites like AutoWeb.com, Car.com, and AutoBuyTel.com and submit their information. You know, the majority of the people uh, may want to just interact right there with the dealer, so we like giving them that menu. Should they want to go that direction, we're more than happy to send them that direction. I love it. Thank you, Scott. Um, by the way, Dan wrote back and he says, thanks so much, Scott. I'll be looking for it on Auto by Tell. Scott, awesome. amazing presentation, my friend. you got to come back and do another one with me. Don't make me I would love don't make to. me pull out the arm bar, man. <laughs> Congratulations, David, Jeff, and Brandy. Um, to that last question, you guys will uh, you guys will experience at least five hundred dollars worth. I'd love to hear how it does for you guys. I would. And too. let's talk. Let, let's let's talk as far as where you guys want to submit those. Uh, where you want us to send that uh, those um, th those customers that traffic. You know specifically your specials page, your SRPs, what have you. Right, right, right. Thank you so much. Yes, congratulations to our winners. Thank you everyone for being here. We're going to start closing out the show. Make sure you download that handout before I end the webinar. For right now, we're going to say goodbye to Scott Peckstein. And I will see you next week, my friend. We're both going to be yeah. at, at the Women in Automotive Conference. Um, but I'll be getting to that in, uh, very shortly. I just want to remind the audience, this webinar has been recorded, and you will get a link to it later on today. You also can go to dealeron.com slash webinar. From there, you can access any of our past webinars. You can also uh, check out our upcoming webinar schedule, too. Also, this webinar is going to conclude in just a minute. And when it does, you're going to get a short survey. Six questions. That's it. Answer that survey. We'd love to know your feedback. We'd love to know your thoughts about today's presentation. Let us know how we did. Let us know how Scott did. Yeah. And you can also give us suggestions for other topics that might be coming up. Uh, let your opinion be heard, okay? And by the way, yes, Scott and I will both be at the upcoming Women in Automotive Conference. Scott is actually presenting. I'm very excited about it. It's going to be next week, June 26th through the 28th in Orlando, Florida. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be emceeing. So if you're going to be there or if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, don't worry. There's still time. Please visit us at womeninautomotive.com or you can check out hashtag womeninauto16. I really hope I get to see you there. All right. And invitations will be going out tomorrow for our next Dealer On webinar. It's a good one too. The five biggest CRM mistakes you're making right now and how to fix them. Would it surprise you to learn that numerous costly CRM mistakes are being made by dealerships all over the country right now? In fact, you're probably making a few of them today. The good news is these CRM errors have quick fixes that will bring swift results. In this one-hour webinar, Bill Wittenmeyer will share the five biggest CRM mistakes you're making right now and how to fix them. He's going to explain how good business basics, streamlined processes, and a modern CRM are the roadmaps to strong sales and gaining market share. He'll also discuss how the right CRM strategy will give your dealership the tools needed to provide an exceptional experience for its employees, as well as connect with consumers in a smarter way to provide them with the Amazon experience that they desire. Attendees of this incredible presentation will also learn how to increase productivity across all departments, use transparency to close more sales more profitably, and acquire and retain more business opportunities. You'll also learn how to drive a higher conversion rate and market share and generate remarkable customer experiences and loyalty. So if you're ready to eliminate the five biggest CRM mistakes you're making right now and then drastically 
improve results, then this is a must-see presentation you can't afford to miss. So register now and don't forget, Dealeron's weekly webinars are held Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, and 9 a.m. Pacific. We got some awesome webinar subjects planned for this year, but you know what? If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions regarding these webinar subjects, our topics, anything, reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. Again, my name is Eliana Raggio. I am everywhere on the internet. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, you name it. I'm on all the automotive social networks. Or, you know what? Just email me directly at eliana at dealeron.com. I so very much look forward to hearing from you. And thank you all so very much for spending this time with us today. We hope to see you all on another webinar in our continuing education series. Take care.